Good morning. Welcome to Duck Church. We're so glad that you've gathered here with us this morning. We are gathered in this place because the Lord is here and we've come to worship him. Uh, do we have any folks who are here visiting with us or maybe you're lucky enough to be on vacation this week? Yes. Look at all of you. Well, I hope um, the hurricane stays offshore for you. If you want to join me in this prayer, this is how I pray with hurricanes. That way, Lord. That way. Like, seriously, that's how I pray. <laughs> so feel free. If you want to copy that, just go for it. Um, I am Amy Denson. I'm the youth pastor. That's why I act a little goofy sometimes. Um, I work with uh, students from 11 years old, and I also work with young adults in our church up to about age 35. So today I'm going to be sharing a little bit about uh, creating a legacy of faith. Uh, it's something that I, I deal with on a regular basis, but all of us are called to and responsible for as parents, grandparents, and members of this church. You made a covenant when kids were baptized in this church that you were going to help them to become disciples of Jesus Christ. So I'm just going to give you some really practical pointers on how we can do that. So I'm excited about that message this morning, and our hymns kind of go along with that idea of making disciples. A couple of announcements. Uh, the United Methodist Women have just published a cookbook, and you can tell that it is now 2017 because there's some quinoa recipes, and there's like protein power balls and all those kind of stuff in there. Uh, so if you want to purchase one of those cookbooks, you can go right out this door after the service is over, and there'll be someone there to sell one to you for $15. Um, and then directory pictures. So we are doing a new church directory. Um, it's been a few years. I've had a son since, so I'm excited that he gets to be included in the church directory. Um, and we want to make sure that everybody gets their picture taken so that we can get to know each other a little bit better. So you can sign up to do that on our church website, duckchurch.org. Or uh, if you want to, you can go right outside the fellowship hall and you can sign up there. Um, and find a time to do that. It's going to be not this weekend, but the following week and into the couple days after that. Who are we remembering in prayer today? Let's start on this side. Yes. John and Keith. John and Keith. Pat and Leslie. Anybody else on this side? Your turn. Anybody on this side? Karen? Yes. Tony? Tony? Good over here? Choir? Yep. Suzanne Slagle. Suzanne Slagle. The Fitzgerald family. The Fitzgerald family. Alex. Alex. Anybody else? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we've come to this place to worship, but we also have concerns, people on our hearts that need you desperately. They need healing and comfort and help and provision. All those things come from you, Lord, so be for them what they need from you. And this morning as we gather, we pray that your Holy Spirit would come be among us, that you would enter our hearts, and that you would speak something specific to each of us so that we might be changed as we leave this place. It's in the name of your servant, Jesus. Amen. Our opening hymn is number 139.
You may be seated. Let us confess our sins to Almighty God. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please continue in silent confession. God, we confess that we often fall short of your will, but your word says that if we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we trust in your promise today that we are your forgiven children. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This morning, our mission moment has to do with these plastic boxes that are right here. Uh, many of you know that our church has been involved with Operation Christmas Child in the past, and we became aware of a need uh, through the United Methodist Church, through our conference of uh, Project Agape, collecting uh, Christmas boxes. Our church has uh, supported Project Agape for many years through our Rainbow Covenant. We give them $1,000 each year as part of our mission and outreach, and um, the ministry in Armenia is the only one in the entire country. Project Agape is the only ministry in the whole country of Armenia, and in that ministry, they help to empower young people. Um, they give families cattle, and so that they might have a, a source of income for their family. They provide summer programs for children where they can learn to do different skills so that they can have a job when they're old enough to do that. Um, and you might be like me, I didn't know where Armenia was. I'm not really a geography scholar, so just for those of y'all who are trying to figure out where Armenia is, it's to the east of Turkey, so like Turkey's the hand right here. Here's Armenia, to the north is Azerbaijan, so this is like the old Soviet bloc, and then uh, down south is Iran. Um, it's one of the oldest Christian countries in the world, but it's also one of the poorest. And so this year, we're going to partner with Project Agape to provide Christmas boxes for children in Armenia. So take a look at this video. It's some of our children in our church showing you how to pack a box. My name is Adam, and we're packing for Armenian children, and it's very important. I am going to pack mittens and a hat for them. And I am Thank you. 
y'all have cute kids. <laughs> uh, if you want to pack a box for the children in Armenia, you can just grab one of these boxes right here and take it with you. Uh, we're going to be collecting them through October 15th. If the ushers would come forward and we'll receive God's tithes and offerings.
Father of the heavenly lights, every good and perfect gift comes down from you. And so we return the first tenth back to you this morning. Please bless the gifts and the givers to your service. Amen. Our hymn is number 463. I invite you to share signs of Christian fellowship and love with one another. standing sorry <laughs> I'm not used to leading traditional worship so I had to stare at what's next so we're going to affirm what we believe through the Apostles Creed let's say it together I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth in Jesus Christ his only son our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified dead and buried the third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, 
the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. seated. So for the last couple of weeks, I've uh, had this theme of legacy kind of swirling around in my head. Some of it is related to uh, what I've been reading in my time with the Lord in the mornings. I've just finished the whole book of Genesis through this summer, which felt like an accomplishment. It's 50 chapters. Uh, But also um, this past Tuesday, Jason's grandmother passed away and Uh, She had gotten kind of sick, and so we were able to rush up there the week before last and go see her uh, before she passed away, which we were really grateful for. But it kind of got me thinking about um, what what kind of older person do I want to be? What kind of things do I want to say to people when I'm about to pass away? And what kind of legacy do I want to leave for those who follow behind me? And specifically, I started thinking about what kind of faith legacy do I want to pass down? Who do I want to impact to help them to know the Lord? And so I uh, want to encourage you, if you can pull out a bulletin or something that you can write on real quick and get a pencil from the pew pad or, you know, just grab something you can write with and something to write on. Everybody ready? All right. Um, Here's what I want you to write down. Write down a couple of names of people who impacted your faith development. Who are some people, maybe from your childhood, or maybe if you came to faith as an adult, who are the people who helped you develop your faith in Jesus Christ? And write some of those names down. I'll give you a second to do that. While you're still writing, I just wanted to share a couple of the people who've impacted my faith when I was younger. Um, Of course, my mom and dad. um, In the brothers family when I was growing up, it was just known that where we went on Sunday mornings was to church. We lived about a half a mile from the church, and so uh, sometimes we would drive ourselves or we would walk to church. That makes me sound way older than I am. Uh, but uh, that's what happened in the brother's family, but uh, it's just what we did. It was part of our lives, and we didn't just attend church. It was uh, important for my family to be involved in the life of the church, and my parents demonstrated that to me. Um, there was also a, a super nice couple. It was a dentist and his wife who was a dental hygienist, and I always thought that was adorable that they worked together. But uh, Mike and Connie Williams um, were incredible at teaching me to have a love for God's word. They, uh, Connie taught my sixth grade Sunday school class, which any of y'all who have sixth graders or who have recently had sixth graders, that is quite the undertaking. She had a lot of patience. Um, and then Mike, he taught a disciple Bible study class my senior year in high school where we went through the entire Bible in one year. And I mean, it was crazy. And, but I learned to love the stories of God and he just had a way of making God's story come alive and and teaching us about God's word. And then when we went off to college, they had built these relationships with us when we were teenagers, and they didn't want to just kind of like toss us off now that we were in college. And so in the summers, Mike and Connie would invite college students over to their house for a Bible study because they wanted us to know that they still cared about us, that we still belonged in our church family, and that they still wanted us to know God. So I was really grateful for the two of them. And then lastly, there was a woman uh, by the name of Diane Racy. We called her Spacey Racy. Um, I don't know much about her at all. I realized when I was trying to think about her life, all I know is that she wore purple a lot, 
she sang in the choir, and then when we got bored sitting in worship, we would kind of play Where's Waldo, but it was with Where's Spacey Racy, and so we would like look around and try to find where she was. She was always in the choir, uh, so it wasn't a very hard game, but uh, Diane, she had been involved with the youth ministry uh, kind of when I was younger, and then by the time I came along, she decided to retire. Um, I hope that wasn't a personal choice. <laughs> I was kind of a hyper kid. Um, but she decided to step away from volunteering with the youth ministry. Uh, but she still stayed in contact with all of the teenagers in the church. And one of the things I really appreciated about her was the way that she encouraged us to use our gifts to serve the Lord. Um, and she would serve alongside of teenagers and try to find ways to help teenagers be involved in the life of the church, instead of being separate over here in the youth ministry, she wanted teenagers to be involved in the whole life of the church, and she continued to encourage me, just in small ways, um, to serve the Lord. So, I know you've written down some names that are on your list, and I want to encourage you, if these people are still living, I encourage you this week just to drop those people a note of thanks, uh, send them a little message on Facebook or whatever you do, um, just thank them for the ways that your life has impacted, been impacted by the legacy that they've left in your life. If those people have now uh, passed away and have died, I encourage you to thank God for those who've passed their faith on to you. Second, you're going to write another list of names. You ready? I want you to think about who are the people in your life that you want to pass your faith on to? Who do you want to pass your faith to? It might be your children, your grandchildren, great-grandchildren, if we've got some great-grandparents in here. It might be kids in your neighborhood. It might be a co-worker. Whoever they are, write those names down. just one more second. I know some of y'all have long lists, especially you grandparents with lots of grandkids, right? <laughs> All right, I wanted you to have a face and a name for the message we're going to hear from God's scripture today, um, because what we're going to look at in the book of Genesis is the story of Jacob passing on his faith to his son Joseph and then to his grandchildren Ephraim and Manasseh. Let me give you a little bit of background information on this story. So Jacob, you probably know the story of Jacob. Uh, he was known as a deceiver. He tricked his father into blessing him uh, as the firstborn son, even though he was the secondborn son. Um, he kind of continues this trickery in this story, you'll see. Um, but he, he wrestled with God, and he really was wrestling with God because he wanted God to bless him, and God did, and then uh, made him crippled for the rest of his life, but he named him Israel um, because he'd be the father of many nations, and he then had 12 children, 12 boys. Can you imagine? Like, 12 boys? <coughs> That's like a youth group by yourself. <laughs> um, he had lots of wives, though, so that it was kind of spread out, but his favorite son was Joseph, and uh, his other brothers knew that Joseph was the favorite. He got jealous, or they got jealous, and so they decide to sell him into slavery, and then they get back home, and they said, Dad, your son is dead, and they do this big charade, you know, and of course he's not dead, but Jacob is totally distraught because his favorite son has died, and, uh, but what ends up happening is Joseph, by uh, lots of crazy providential events that happen in his life, he becomes one of the most powerful people in Egypt, and then his brothers eventually come to Egypt, and his father does too, and they're reunited. And so Jacob hasn't really been involved in Joseph's life uh, as an adult, and he's not really had a relationship with his grandchildren very much. He's just sort of getting to know them as he's coming to the end of his life. So what we're going to look at here, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 48 if you want to look it up. Um, I'm reading from the New Living Translation because that's what teenagers use and it's what I understand. So it might be different from what's in the pew. Uh, but if you have one of those handy-dandy um, Bibles on your phone and you want to follow along, I'm going to be in the New Living Translation. So chapter 48, verse 1. One day not long after this, word came to Joseph, Your father is failing rapidly. So Joseph went to visit his father and took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. When Joseph arrived, Jacob was told, Your son Joseph has come to you. 
So Jacob gathered his strength and sat up in his bed. Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me. He said to me, I will make you fruitful and I will multiply your descendants. I will make you a multitude of nations and I will give this land of Canaan to your descendants after you as an everlasting possession. Now I am claiming as my own sons these two boys of yours, Ephraim and Manasseh, who were born here in the land of Egypt before I arrived. They will be my sons just as Reuben and Simeon are. But any children born to you in the future will be your own and they will inherit land within the territories of their brothers Ephraim and Manasseh. Long ago, as I was returning from Paddan Aram, Rachel died in the land of Canaan. Rachel was Joseph's mother. <clears throat> we were still on the way, some distance from Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. So with great sorrow, I buried her there beside the road to Ephrath. Then Jacob looked over at the two boys. Are these your sons, he asked. Yes, Joseph told him. They are the sons God has given me here in Egypt. And Jacob said, bring them closer to me so I can bless them. Jacob was half blind because of his age and could hardly see. So Joseph brought the boys close to him, and Jacob kissed and embraced them. Then Jacob said to Joseph, I never thought I would see your face again, but now God has let me see your children too. Joseph moved the boys who were at their grandfather's knees, and he bowed with his face to the ground. Then he positioned the boys in front of Jacob. With his right hand, he directed Ephraim towards Jacob's left hand, and with his left hand, he put Manasseh at Jacob's right hand. But Jacob crossed his arms as he reached out to lay his hands on the boys' heads. <clears throat> he put his right hand on the head of Ephraim, though he was the younger boy, and his left hand on the head of Manasseh, though he was the firstborn. Then he blessed Joseph and said, May the God before whom my grandfather Abraham and my father Isaac walked the God who has been my shepherd all of my life to this very day, the angel who has redeemed me from all harm, may he bless these boys. May they preserve my name and the names of Abraham and Isaac, and may their descendants multiply greatly throughout the earth. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So there's a couple of things that we can pull out of this story of ways that we can pass on our faith to those we want to see become believers in Jesus Christ. First, Jason, uh, Jacob uh, starts out by sharing his own story, his own connection with God. He talks about the ways that he's experienced God in the past, and he tells it like a story to these grandsons of his. And when we think about passing on our faith to younger generations, it's important that we share stories or testimonies about ways that God has been active in our lives, that those don't remain secret, but they become part of dinner table conversation on a regular basis. So sharing the ways that you've struggled in your relationship with God, the doubts that you've had, the ways that God has been proven trustworthy and faithful, the ways that God has provided for you. Whatever those stories are in your life, share those stories with those you want to pass your faith on to. It's one thing to read about God in a book, but it's another thing to see that God who was around thousands of years ago is still working today and active. So share stories of your connection with God. Second, um, you might have seen that this is a really intimate, close moment that happens between Jacob, Joseph, and the grandsons. Uh, there's a lot of hugging and kissing, and it sounds like that uh, Jacob has pulled these grandsons onto his knee. And it's important for us, uh, particularly in our families, with our children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, whoever it is, uh, that we show signs of love and physical affection. When we hug and kiss and high-five or pat on the back our kids, it shows them that they are loved unconditionally, that they are accepted and that they are affirmed for who they are, no matter what. Um, and as kids get older, as they get to the age uh, of kids that I work with, it's a little bit harder to do this because they sort of uh, push you away anytime that you try to hug them, especially in public. I wouldn't really recommend that. Um, and, but uh, it's important when it's kind of like behind closed doors, when it's just you and your kids, that you continue to show this kind of physical love and affection to your kids. It helps them to know that they are secure, that no matter what they do, that they're accepted. And when you show them that kind of acceptance and love, then they are reminded of the God who is faithful 
and loving. When we are loving to our kids, then they know that God is also loving. So share signs of meaningful touch. And then lastly, it talks about uh, this blessing that Jacob gives over the grandsons. He actually speaks words of blessing. And it's interesting what Jacob does here. He talks about who God has been to him. He uses different names. He says, the God of my grandfather, Abraham. So he's talking about a God who's been active through multiple generations in his family. He talks about the God who has been my shepherd and the angel who has redeemed me from all harm. That's, he's referring then to the time that he wrestled with God. So he's talking about specific names of God, specific ways that God has been in his life, and he's praying those names of God over his children and his grandchildren. He's saying, God has been my shepherd. May he be your shepherd. God has been the angel who has protected me from harm. May he protect you from harm. And we can do that for our kids as well. We can speak those kinds of things over our children, grandchildren, or those, that we, care, those we care about that we want to pass our faith on to. Um, and then he does something else. He, he takes the, the promises of God that have been made to him, and he applies those promises to his grandchildren. He said, God told me that my descendants would be a great nation, and so I'm going to pray and bless you with that same promise that God has given to me. And he didn't just give that promise to me, he gave it to my father Isaac over here. He made that promise to Isaac. And then he also made this promise to Abraham. And even before all that, at the very beginning of God's story, when God is talking to Adam and Eve in the garden, he gives them the command, be fruitful and multiply. And it's not an accident that Jacob, when he prays this blessing, he says, may their descendants multiply greatly throughout the earth. So what he's doing here is he's taking promises of God, which for us would be scripture, things that God says in his scripture that are promises to us. He's taking those promises and then he is speaking those promises over the people he wants to pass his faith on to. This could be something that you do through prayer. Um, as you pray God's word over your children, your grandchildren, or whoever you want to pass your faith to, and, but even more importantly, I think it's important that we speak God's word over those we want to pass our faith on to. Let me give you an example of this. So I have a, a two-year-old son, James. Um, he's just learning to speak, so he doesn't quite understand the things that come out of my mouth on a regular basis. But uh, last night, I had him up on the changing table. He was about to go to bed, and I said, James, look at me. And so he did. He locked eyes with me. I said, James, you are God's masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he prepared in advance for you to do. And that's from Ephesians 2, chapter 10. And he kind of looked at me like, whatever, Mom. Uh, but, <laughs> and I'm sure he'll actually say that at some point. He can't get those words out quite yet. But it's important for James to know his identity, that Christ has called him for a purpose, that he is God's masterpiece that has been crafted together, and his identity is in who his creator is. And I'm sure you have passages of scripture that are meaningful to you, that you can pray over your children, that you can speak over your children either verbally, or maybe you can write them a note that's really um, significant for them that they can keep. I think it's important for us to actually speak out the promises of God over those that we're seeking to pass our faith on to. So um, I would be remiss as a youth pastor if I didn't uh, talk a little bit about our youth ministry. Um, as I said <coughs> before, all of us are called to care for young people, uh, whether they're in our families or not. And when kids are baptized in this church, or in any United Methodist church, we make a promise to them. We tell them we're going to help them to grow as disciples of Jesus Christ. So we all have that responsibility to pass on our faith to others. And so I wanted to share with you a little bit about what goes on in the youth ministry and maybe ways that you can be involved in passing on faith to the youth who are in our church. Um, our church does an incredible job of loving teenagers. Teenagers are not always easy to love, um, and, but a lot of times they are. They're the most passionate, loving, caring people that I know. They'll take risks that most of us adults will just kind of look at them and get really scared about, but I follow them anyway because I think they're following the leading of God and uh, so it's, it's fun to be involved with younger people in the church. Uh, but there's kind of a disturbing statistic 
Um, that doesn't really bode well for uh, my job security in the youth ministry field. Um, the statistic is that out of high school seniors who were active in their church or in their youth group in their senior year of high school, only 40% of those students will continue to practice their faith as after high school. And I see some nodding heads, like you've seen this happen before. So let me say it again. These aren't kids who like show up maybe once every two months to youth group. These are active kids in our church who are staying connected with God throughout high school, and then they, after high school, only 40% of those students are still connected in their relationship with God, are still practicing their faith. It's hard to measure, like, if somebody actually has a relationship with God, but we're talking about are they praying, are they uh, attending church, are they involved in Christian fellowship, wherever they are. So only 40% of a success rate for youth ministry is not very good. Uh, but there's been some really good research that's been done in the last uh, maybe five or six years in ways that we can change the tide on that. Uh, and one of the things that they have found is that of those 40% whose faith stuck, uh, each of those students had relationships with five different adults in the church. So five adults who cared about them and cared about their relationship with God for every one kid. Right? When we usually think about ratios with adults to kids, we think the other way. We think one adult to like eight kids. Or if you work in the public school system, it's like one adult to like mm, 25 yeah, <laughs> so that's not very good odds. But in the church, what we found that really works is five adults to one kid. And that doesn't mean that every one of you needs to become a volunteer in the youth ministry. I think that would sort of overwhelm our kids and they might run away. Um, but there are, um, there are ways that you can be involved in being one of those five adults for our kids. Um, and one of the things that I've been uh, really encouraged by recently is the most recent research out of Fuller Youth Institute in California said that uh, the thing that draws teenagers to a church and helps the church grow young uh, is not about being cool, which makes me feel really good because I'm not cool. <laughs> the kids will tell me that on a regular basis. So if you don't feel cool, like... <clears throat> There is success for you. It's not about being cool. It's not about having flashy programs or doing really cool things. It's about being warm. It's about being a church that is welcoming, inviting to teenagers. It's about noticing the teenagers who are in our church services, who are walking down the hallways, who are being really loud when they come down the steps because the Sunday school teacher is kind of over it and they let them go like five minutes early from Sunday school. Then to say hi to those kids, to help them feel welcome and loved. Uh, but there's a couple of specific things that you can do um, if you want to be involved uh, in being one of those five adults for our youth. Every Sunday night at youth group, we have youth group every Sunday from five to seven, uh, we have dinner. And I tell our youth that it is Christian to eat together. Right? Okay, it's Christian to eat together. So we, every time our teenagers get together, we eat. Um, which doesn't bode well for my diet. Um, but... Uh, we have people who volunteer to cook dinner on Sunday nights, and that might be you. You might uh, be willing to cook, or even if you don't cook, you can pick up some fried chicken from the Harris Teeter. That's the best, by the way. And you can bring it over to the fellowship hall on Sunday night and feed our kids. But more importantly than just, like, giving us food is the connections that happen. As the kids are coming around and getting their food, you're having conversations with them. And then after they've gotten their food to come and sit down with our youth and chat with them and see how they're doing. So if you're interested in cooking dinner for the youth, I would love to know. Uh, second, we have a confirmation class here uh, where our sixth graders, middle school or age students are involved in a process of deciding for themselves if they want to follow Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and if they want to be an active member of our church. So part of that process is that each of those students is matched with an adult confirmation mentor. And so that person doesn't have to be a biblical scholar. They don't have to know a lot about the Bible. They just need to love Jesus and love kids. And it's a one-on-one -on -one relationship that happens through phone calls, uh, through getting together with a couple of students and a couple of mentors just to hang out together. And really, it's just trying to add another number to that five adults for that one kid. Uh, so if you are interested in doing that, confirmation happens usually January through March. Um, in the spring, so uh, we'll be looking for mentors coming up soon. Um, also, a lot of you are involved in different ministries and missions 
in the church. You do a lot of different stuff. And some of y'all aren't even from here. Uh, But you might be involved with ministries and missions in your church at home. And I encourage you to think about what are ways that we can include young people in the things that our church is already doing. Maybe they would like to do the things that the adults are doing in the church, but they just haven't been invited because adults seem scary. And maybe you haven't invited the teenagers because teenagers seem scary. Um, So (laughs) providing a way for them to serve alongside of you is incredible. Keep in mind that uh, most of our students don't drive. Uh, so they might need rides. Keep in mind that they're in school during the day, so if the things that you do happen during the school day, it's going to be really difficult for them to be involved with it. But they are passionate, and they want to be involved with stuff that's going on in the church. Uh, Another way that you can connect with teenagers in service is uh, through the tech team. we got Sydney and Misty back there, some of our youth, young adult peoples. Um, Most of our tech team is teenagers, and it's because... Um, they're not scared of the equipment back there. Um, <clears throat> but uh, one of the things that is so helpful when it comes to building relationships with teenagers, especially with boys, is to just do stuff with them. Um, and we have tons of teenagers who help out in the back, and we don't have any adult helpers. Um, and it would be awesome for there to be a couple of adults in this service and the other services who wouldn't mind hanging out back there a couple times a month Uh, just to build a relationship with the teenagers and then click a button every once in a while. That's kind of all it takes. Um, So I encourage you to get involved with that. And then lastly, um, every October, as it gets close to fall break for our college students, we put together college care packages for them. Uh, They love them. Uh, They love getting the ramen noodles and the oatmeal and the chapstick and the post-it notes and all that kind of stuff. So you are welcome to provide some of those things, but even more important than that, uh, this is a great way for you to share a blessing, like a verbal blessing with one of our college students, to encourage them to continue on in their faith, to share with them a scripture that's meaningful to you. And just, well, as long as you write the person's name on the front, we won't read the note, I promise. We'll just stick it in the care package with them. So in the next couple of weeks, we're going to have bulletin inserts that have the names of all of those students on them. Um, And I encourage you to write a couple of notes to some of those students so that we can uh, toss them into their care packages on October 15th. I want to end by reading one of my favorite stories Uh, from The Great Divorce, which is a book by C.S. Lewis, and it's a story about heaven and hell. Um, And it's kind of an allegory. And what happens is at the beginning of the story, down in hell, uh, there's a bus. And the bus is going to take people to heaven, and they're going to kind of take a tour of what heaven is like and then go back down to hell after it's done. It's sort of cruel, actually, um, that they get a view of heaven and all that they're missing out on. Uh, But there's this moment at the very end of the story where there's this great procession that comes through heaven. And there's a long line of boys on one side of the procession, and there's a long line of girls on the other side of the procession. And there's this great party, fanfare, and everything, and it's this huge celebration. And at the very end of this procession is this woman. And so the man who is speaking here asks a question to his tour guide. He says, is it? Is it? He thinks it might be God, but it's not. He says, no, 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 not at all, said he. It's someone you'll never have heard of. Her name on earth was Sarah Smith, and she lived at Golders Green. She seems to be, well, a person of particular importance. Aye, she is one of the great ones. You've heard that fame in this country and fame on earth are two quite different things. Well, who are all these young people and women, or sorry, young men and women on each side? They're her sons and daughters. She must have had a very large family, sir. Every young man or boy that met her became her son, even if it was only the boy that brought the meat to her back door. Every girl that met her was her daughter. Isn't that a bit hard on their own parents? No. There are those who steal other people's children, but her motherhood was of a different kind. Those on whom it fell went back to their natural parents, loving them even more. I want to encourage you, Duck Church, to be Sarah Smith for the kids in our congregation. Be the nameless person who gets to know them, who finds out about their life, who follows up with them, asks them about how their relationship with God is, and encourage them in their faith. 
In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 571. Now may you go in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to pass on a legacy of faith to those that you love. Amen. Amen.